Everett for the transaction of criminal business is now open and in session. The Honorable Judge Randolph is signing. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Please be seated. Thank you. Is the state ready to proceed? I am, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, may be heard briefly? Yes. Your Honor, if the state intends to call Mike Mann first, I, the only thing I'd like to do is admit and um, mark as an exhibit four pages. I can pass up a copy. I don't plan to admit it, but I do need it marked for ID. I don't plan on calling Attorney Meehan first, Your Honor. I have a lay witness here. Okay, we can address that first. after. Right. Thank you, Your Honor. And I would also indicate if counsel wishes to introduce anything, she could do so in the course of, of her cross-examination. I would like a copy, and I can hand up um, counsel copies of what I have for the witnesses as well. I do have one for, I do have a disc for Mr. Hodkins. I can hand that over and a copy for the counsel. Is there anything that needs to be addressed before the jury needs to come out? No, Your Honor, I thought it would be smoother to do it that way, but we can do it once I get up for cross. That's fine. That's fine. If I can, Your Honor. Bring the jury out, please. It's only two clips. Council stipulate, please. Yes, yes, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. We continue with the stage case. Thank you, Your Honor. The state would call Garrison Hutkins to the stand. If I may just approach the clerk. Yes. Solemnly and sincerely affirm as the case may be that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I help you God upon penalty of perjury. I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Garrison Hudkins, H U D K I N S. And so you may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Mr. Huggins, where do you reside? To Jefferson Crossing. And how long have you lived at Two Jefferson Crossing? Since 2010. When did, well, who did you buy your house from? We bought our house from Fotis and Jennifer Dulos. When did you first meet Fotis Dulos? We met Fotis when we were looking for a home. We moved from New Canaan to Farmington. And when we were looking for a home, this home was for sale. We made a phone call and we went and visited the home. And Fotis was the builder of the home, and he showed us the home himself. Did you also meet Jennifer Dulos? Yes, we met her at that same time when we visited the home. And did who owned the proper who owned your house basically before you uh, purchased it? I'm I'm sorry. Who owned the property before you purchased it? Fotis and Jennifer owned it themselves. And after you purchased it, uh, where did they move to? I believe they moved um, to a home in Avon, and while they were building the house for Jefferson Crossing, next door to us. Now you say next door to you. Where is Fort Jefferson Crossing? Fort Jefferson Crossing is the home. Um, I'm going to use directions immediately to the east of our home. Okay. Now I'm going to actually. May I just have one moment of counsel, Your Honor? Yes. No. Your Honor, state would offer 141. I don't believe there's any objection. I would ask that it be moved That's into correct. evidence. No objection. State 141 admitted as full.
I'm going to open a file labeled map. If I can, and ask you, sir, if you can just take a look at the screen behind you. And do you see where Jefferson Crossing is on that map? I do. Would you mind standing up, sir, sure. and uh, pointing to it? Jefferson Crossing, the road is right here. Okay. Are you also familiar with Mountain Spring Road in Farmington? I am. Is that depicted on the map as well? Yes, it is. Uh, could you please point to it, please? Mountain Spring Road runs here all the way down to Route 4. Thank you. And for the record, you're pointing to the bottom left middle of the screen? I am. Thank you. So if you could, if you wouldn't mind standing up there for a minute, I'm going to open file marked map of Jefferson Crossing. And uh, sir, do you recognize what's depicted on the map? I do. What is depicted on the map? Well, primarily, it is the road Jefferson Crossing in the area of Farmington to the west. I'm going to use directions northeast, southwest to the west is Eli Road, Jefferson Crossing, you know, runs east, west into a cul-de-sac. Um, there's seven homes on Jefferson Crossing. Uh, it's a private road. I'm gonna uh, we, we have scroll. a homeowners association. Well, I'm going to scroll in a little bit. Is your residence depicted on this? It is. Could you please point to it? Okay. And Jefferson Crossing? This is Jefferson Crossing down to cul-de-sac. And the road to the left, please, going, I guess, north and south? From here down is Eli Road. Okay. And, sir, where's Ford Jefferson Crossing? Ford Jefferson Crossing is right here. Okay. Now, sir, you indicated this was a, a housing, houses built by Fotis Dulos. Did you also have a housing association? We did. We had a homeowners association. Okay. If you wouldn't mind having a seat. <clears throat> <clears throat> Who was involved in the homeowners association? Well, all the homeowners were members of the association. Could, could I at least have a timeline, Your Honor? This is now what found the foundation, at least in terms of when who was involved. Sure. Um, we'll start with 2000, around the time period of 2017. 2017. Yes, sir. Um, there were all the residents of Jefferson Crossing were members of the homeowners association, including Photos Dulos? including Fotis Dulos. Okay. And did you have meetings? We did. And where were the meetings held? Uh, up until 2019, we had those meetings in Fotis's offices at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Prior to 2017, would Jennifer attend those meetings? She would. Okay. And after 2017, did she attend any of those meetings? So the meetings were usually held in the beginning of each year. So it'd be in the beginning of 18, beginning of 19, and et cetera. So she did not attend the meeting in the beginning of 18. Okay. Now, in 2017, did you learn that Jennifer had left Fort Jefferson Crossing in Photos Dulos? I did learn that, yes. Prior to 2017, uh, what would you characterize your relationship with Jennifer Dulos as? Very friendly. I mean, they were, Jennifer was a great neighbor. Um, the, our kids attended the same school. We saw them at school functions. Uh, the kids played. We, we saw them um, in the neighborhood. Uh, we saw them out and about. We had uh, gone to their home for Greek Easter, as an example. They came to our home for like an Oscar viewing party. We went out to dinner with them a couple times in West Hartford Center. So, you know, neighborly. Uh, did you ever meet Michelle Traconis? I did. When did you meet Michelle Traconis? In August of 2017. Could you please explain that first meeting? Yes. Um, Fotis called and asked if he could come over for a drink to introduce us to Michelle. Michelle, you see, was moving into Fort Jefferson Crossing. And Michelle also had a daughter that was my daughter's age, and they were going to be attending the same school. So Fotis wanted to introduce Michelle uh, and her daughter to our family um, as a way to get into the neighborhood, to get to know the neighborhood. And when was that? It was in August of 2017. Now I'm going to draw your attention to Memorial Day weekend of 2019. Okay. Uh, did you learn that Jennifer had been missing since May 24th? Uh, I learned uh, mid-morning on the 25th that Jennifer was missing. How did you learn that information? 
Well, in the early morning of the 25th, um, a neighbor had called me before Objection, it. hearsay. Well, the state is probably not offering for the truth, but to indicate how this witness came to know about Jennifer Dulos being missing, overruled. In the early morning of the 25th, a neighbor uh, had called me on my cell phone, which during the work week would not be unusual, but on a Saturday it would, um, alerting me to the fact that an unmarked Farmington police officer was on the road. Um, and, and he had no indication as to why he was on the road. Um, and he asked him, but the Farmington police officer would not tell him. Um, later that morning, um, as I mentioned before, we moved from New Canaan to Farmington. Friends from New Canaan had sent my wife a news article. Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Okay. If you can, sir, is that how you learned about Jennifer Dulos being missing? That's correct, from a news article, correct. Okay. Uh, did you speak to Fotis Dulos that weekend? I did. Where were you when you spoke to him? Uh, I was in uh, the front of my house in my driveway. What were you doing? I was taking my dog for a walk. What did Fotis Dulos look like? Um, he had a shaved head, and he, I did not recognize him initially. Um, he was riding a one-wheel scooter past my home up towards Eli Road. And I, that was unusual to see someone doing that, especially towards Eli Road. But more importantly, I didn't, I didn't recognize who it was. It is a private road, as I mentioned. So it didn't, I didn't know who it was. Around what time of day was this? About 8.45 in the morning. Did you speak to him? He did approach me, and that's when I recognized his voice and recognized it was Fotis. What did he say to you? Well, at first I, I said to Fotis, you know, how are you? And his response to me was, you know Jennifer's missing, right? And what did you say? Uh, I said to him, yes, I'd heard that. I hope she's okay, but I have not heard about the children. I hope they're okay. What was his response? His response was, um, he asked me how long we retained our security video and to make sure it didn't get deleted because he needed to prove that he was there on Friday. Did he say anything else to you? He did. What did he say? Uh, he talked about uh, going to New Canaan on Saturday uh, and how the police uh, seized his phone. He talked about his attorney uh, telling him that they need to develop uh, a chronological timeline of where they were on Friday uh, so that they can produce it if needed. Uh, did he use the word they? He did use the word they. That they needed to develop a timeline? He did. Did there come a time when Fotis Dulos spoke to you again? He did. Uh, with respect to your camera and video surveillance? He called me on May 30th, on that Thursday, uh, asking to come over at that point in time to review our video. And did you allow him to do that? I was at the office. I was working and I told him that wasn't a great time to do that. Did you ever speak to him again? Uh, uh, not until the summer. Now, I do want to ask you about your video camera and your video system. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have cameras in place on May 24th? I had two cameras in place on May 24th. What type of cameras were they? <clears throat> they were ring cameras. And where were they located? Uh, one was located on the corner of our garage facing the parking area near our four garage doors. And one was a doorbell cam by our mudroom facing out the eastern part of our driveway towards Jefferson Crossing. Did you subsequently get a third camera? I did. When did you do that? I got that camera on May 26th. Where did you place that camera? I placed that camera in the northwest corner of the house, facing out towards the road. If you can, sir, I'm going to scroll into the map behind you. Would you mind uh, standing up and just pointing to where you installed that camera the on one, May 26th? Uh, that camera would have been installed on this corner of the house. Okay, and what area did it capture? This area towards Jefferson Crossing. 
And you installed that after your conversation with Fotos Dulos? I did. Okay. And after you had learned that Jennifer had been missing? I did. Uh, sir, what, was that camera motion activated or a continuous stream? It was motion activated. Uh, could it pick up the uh, motion that was on the road, cars passing and the like? Yes, it could. And was the time accurate? Yes, it was. Now, how long have you, did you say you lived at Jefferson Crossing? You can have a seat, okay. I'm sorry. Since 2010. Okay. And for how long did Fotos Dulos uh, reside at Fort Jefferson Crossing right next to you? I believe they moved in, in the 2012-2013 timeframe. Okay. So, uh, between 2012 and 2019, particularly the time period of 2019, uh, are you familiar with the vehicles that were associated with Fotos Dulos? I am. What were those cars? There was a, a black Suburban, there was a Ford Raptor, there was a white Jeep Grand Cherokee, uh, there was a Porsche Cayenne, um, but that hadn't been seen for a while. I believe that was crashed. Um, and then from time to time, there was a red, Ford, a red Toyota Tacoma that was parked at Fort Jefferson Crossing for periods of time. Who owned, to your knowledge, the red Toyota? Objection, <laughs> hearsay, no foundation. Oh. The question is, who owned, to your knowledge, the Toyota Tacoma? Well, the court's going to sustain the objection. Mr. Huggins, uh, do you know somebody by the name of Pavel Gormini? I do. How do you know him? Pavel worked for uh, Fotis for a long time. He did a lot of maintenance for us, for the association up and down the road. Um, and part of that means was he did all the snow plowing for the road and for our homes, for a lot of our homes up and down Jefferson Crossing. Do you know what vehicle he uses to plow the roads? Yes. What vehicle is that? It was a red Toyota Tacoma. Did you see that vehicle parked at Fort Jefferson Crossing uh, from time to time? I did. Okay, particularly in 2019, did you see that vehicle parked? I did. Where was it usually parked? Um, okay. It was usually parked in this area. How could you see it from, you're putting to, I'm sorry, the lower right-hand corner? Kind of the southern part of the driveway. Okay. And were you able to view it from the road? We could view it from our driveway. Okay. Now, sir, I'm gonna, at some point, did the uh, New Canaan police or state police come to your residence and speak to you? They did, they came to our residence on uh, May 27th. And what did they ask of you? So uh, three officers came, two from the state police, one from New Canaan. Objection, non-responsive. Well, so what did they do? Well, uh, the court is going to allow Attorney Manning to ask the question again. What did they ask you to do, sir? Well, first they asked for our video. Um, they also asked what we saw, <laughs> the cars that we knew were used from time to time at Fort Jefferson Crossing. Um, they asked about the relationship, as we knew it, between Fotis and Jennifer. And did you allow them uh, access to your video camera that day? Well, I, I did not. We were frankly on our way to a Bruins game, and we spent about an hour with them and then hustled off the Bruins game. And when we returned home, we then emailed them the videos. Okay. When you say you emailed them the videos, what do you mean by that? If you could just explain. So with the ring camera, you can download each snippet, and I downloaded what was not us tripping the cameras and emailed it to Officer Deke in New Canaan. Now, on, uh, did, what day was that, by the way? I'm sorry. That you day? downloaded the, the cameras I, and emailed them I, I, to I the I think we police. started downloading them on when we got back from the Bruins game and then emailed them on that Tuesday. Did that include the, was that before or after the new camera was installed? Well, it was, we emailed them after the new camera was installed. Did there come a time when you reviewed footage from May 29th of 2019? There did. When did you do that? Um, around July 27th, I looked at it. Why did you review May 29th in July? Well, when, when, I, when I spoke to Fotos on the 26th, he requested that I not have anything deleted. I did not know what the retention policy was for the ring service plans. So then I learned at that point in time it was 60 Objection. days. Objection, hearsay. Well, 
what he learned? Well, the phrase, what I learned, need not be considered hearsay. The court does not know what the balance of the statement is. If I may, Your Honor, it's the fact that the ring camera, his retention period he learned was 60 days. State's not offering that for the truth of the matter that it was 60 days, just what he did with that and why, what steps he took after he learned that information. So oh, it's not offered for a hearsay. Objection. I would also objection is withdrawn. Thank you. Sir, if you can continue. So that was at the 60 day time period. And um, when I was originally um, requested by the officers who came to our home on the 27th, they were only looking for video from the 24th. So when I was looking at all the cameras, I was looking to see what they had and preserve that video so it wasn't erased. And did you find or did you preserve any video or send it to the police after in that July date? I did. What did you send? I, send them, I sent them, I believe, two videos of uh, vehicle movements on Jefferson Crossing on May 29th. Why did you choose those videos? Um, for a few reasons. Um, n number one, um, I wasn't asked for video after the May 24th timeframe. But in seeing the movement of those two vehicles in tandem, coupled with my odd interaction with FOTUS on the 26th, coupled with what was well known, publically Objection. available. Here we get, now we're getting into hearsay. Well, if it appeared in the media, it's well known, overruled. What was well known at the time of movement in the north end of Hartford, that movement just struck me as odd. Did you send those clips to the police? I did. Yes. Sir, I'm going to show you uh, what has been marked as file 529804. I'm going to stop it first, sir. What are we looking at? So this camera's, we'll call it facing north from the northwest corner of my home, uh, out over my driveway and my front yard, and onto Jefferson Crossing. And what time is this recorded? 8.04 in the morning. Sir, I'm actually going to ask you a few questions about this video, if I can. Um, now, as we play it, this street in the middle, do you see the cursor? I do. Is that Jefferson Crossing? That is Jefferson Crossing. Okay. Where is for Jefferson Crossing? So, um, to the right of the screen, you'll see a tree line, and for Jefferson Crossing is to the right. And where's the driveway to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Um, it's probably about 50 yards to the east of my driveway. If you can, sir, would you mind pointing to it on the screen? Sure. So Jefferson Crossing would be behind these trees right here. Okay. And if I were to bring the file back at around 14 seconds, do you see a vehicle? In that area? I do. Yeah, actually. Is that vehicle turning into the driveway for Jefferson Crossing? Yes, that vehicle is turning the driveway for Jefferson Crossing. Okay. Is this the, vi the video clip you sent to the police? That's one of them. I'm gonna, you can have a seat, sir. I'm going to play, oh, I apologize, uh, 529856. If you could take a look. I'm going to stop it there briefly, sir. Um, is this the video that you sent to the police as That's, well? That is one of them, yes. And why did you send this clip? 
Well, as I, I said before, um, what we knew on the... I'm going to hit play. In July, what we knew, based on the media reports, it was different. Objection. The fact that there were these reports is one thing, but now I was getting to the what he learned in the media. Well, the question was essentially, what's the reason you sent these videos to the police? And this witness, this witness is explaining his reason. Yeah, but the fact that he, based on something in the media, is answers the question. I would submit that anything else would be just clear hearsay. Well, the witness is explaining what he did and his reasons for it. Overruled. If you can, sir, explain why you sent this video to the police. So again, based upon that interaction I had with Fotis on the 26th, based upon the fact um, of what we had learned from the media at that point in time and the visits to North End, I had two cars leaving in tandem, which was not consistent with normal vehicle movement patterns. And you've lived at that residence for how many years at that point? Nine years. Now, you indicated you were familiar with the vehicles and the vehicle patterns. Yes. Um, do you recognize this vehicle, the red truck? Yeah, that, that's Pavel's truck. And what about the vehicle behind it? Well, that vehicle is a, uh, that's a GMC Yukon XL. Um, mm -hmm. That was a rental. Okay. It, was that the vehicle that we saw in the previous clip? It was. I'll say that that's the 804 one. And I apologize, I wasn't sure if I said the time of the second video. Just pause it there. Uh, 529 at what time? 856 and 43 seconds. Right. I may just have one moment, Your Honor. Okay. Oh, that's right. Sir, with respect to, I'm not sure if I got your answer. Uh, with respect to the 804 clip and the 856 uh, clip, that black vehicle, is it the same vehicle? It is. Thank you. I have nothing further. Cross examination. I'm just going to start with what we were just looking at a minute ago. Um, you testified uh, that you were very familiar with the comings and goings of all the vehicles at the uh, Dulos home or at his office. Is that correct? I don't think that's what I said. You said it was unusual for two cars to be driving down Fort Jefferson Crossing at the same time, correct? I did say that. And you said that the vehicle that you saw was a GMC vehicle? A GMC Yukon XL. And you knew it was an XL? Yes. And are you in the car business? I am. And which uh, company, what, car, what company do you sell cars with? We have an a, a auto auction. Oh, okay. And you had listed the cars that were associated with uh, the, the uh, Ford Group in the Dulos home, correct? You mentioned three or four vehicles. I did right. mention some vehicles, that's correct. Right. Do you ever meet any of the other employees at the Ford Group? Yes. So you knew, for example, did you know an Andy Loomis who worked there? I did not know Andy, no. Um, did you know a Guillaume Villaday? I did know Guillaume. Did he drive one of these cars? Uh, at that point in time, Guillaume wasn't around. He wasn't there in 2019? I don't recall him being an employee in 2019, no. All right, so you kept track of who was working at what time at the, at the Ford Group? I, I just don't recall seeing Guillaume around in 2019. Okay. Didn't realtors also come back and forth from the uh, Ford Group offices? Of course they did. Did you uh, take down any of those uh, videos or record any of those? No. Did you send any others besides the two we just saw to the police? I did. From May 29th? 
I don't recall how many I sent from May 29th, but I did send a few. So we're only seeing the two that someone else picked out among the ones you sent, correct? Correct. Let, let me just ask you, um, and, and incidentally, a GMC uh, Yukon XL was not a car that was generally, as you said, associated with being at the residence of Ford Jefferson Crossing, correct? Not prior to, to May of 2019, no. And um, did you look at a whole bunch to see how many days that that Yukon stopped at that house? No, I did. And I assume as being involved in the auto business, you don't work out of your home. I do not. So let me just then, you, you talked about meeting uh, Mr. Dulos and meeting Jennifer, correct? I did. And knowing their children, right? That's correct. And at some point you said in August of 2017, you were introduced, I think you said, to my client, Michelle Traconis? That's correct. And her daughter was the same as one of your children? That's correct. Did your children go to Renbrook School? Yes, they did. And then she went to, her, kid, her child went to Renbrook too, right? I believe for one year, yes. And I just want to be uh, extra careful about the conversation that you had with Mr. Dulos on the, I think you said it was the Sunday after the, uh, you had heard that Jennifer was missing. Is that what you said? It was like a couple of days later? I did say that, yes. And you called saying that it was on the Sunday, the 27th, uh, 26th? It was on Sunday, May 26th. Okay. And according to what I just wrote down, he came up to you and um, you, you said you first didn't recognize him. Is that what you said? That's what I said. So when's the last time you'd seen him before that that you had said you didn't recognize him? Oh, that was five years ago. I don't know the answer to that. All right. You didn't seem like on a daily basis, right? No, 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 no. He wasn't someone who hung out in his yard and you're out by the mailbox chatting with him. Not when you have two and a half acre properties with woods between them, no. But you did know, uh, I assume, that he was involved in competitive water skiing. I assume you knew that, right? Oh, yeah, sure. So you also knew that in the past, he had cut his hair really, really short because as a competitive water skier. Didn't he tell you about that? Objection. It calls for hearsay. Well, Speculation. Well, the question is, well, there was a narrative and then there was a question. He was a competitive water skier. He cut his hair short, which is not a question. Didn't he talk to you about being a competitive water skier? <laughs> so the question is, did he talk to you about being a competitive water skier? OK. Can you answer that question? I can answer that question. All right. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. Did he ever invite you to watch him do any of his tricks or jumps or anything down at the uh, water skiing lake down the street? Objection. Relevance outside the scope. Your Honor, we went through five, seven years of the relationship. I'm at least entitled to ask a couple of questions about the nature of that relationship. Well, did he ever invite you? Is a preliminary question. Did you ever go would be more focused. All right. That's a preliminary question. Did he ever invite you to go uh, watch him? No, he did not. And I take you, you never went and watched him? No, I did perform not. Perform or compete? No, I did not. But you also know that in prior years, he had cut his hair for water skiing. Objection, correct? Your Honor. Well, the, the question really is, did he have a, the same kind of haircut in prior years? That's the question. And if that's the question, overruled. If that's not the question, sustained. Well, that'll be the question then. In prior years, do you recall that he had uh, cut his hair short? As I said before, he, he had cut his hair short, but I've never seen it that short. I did not recognize him when I saw him that day on the 26th. Okay. 
So if I showed you pictures from previous years, that would not refresh your recollection as to whether he had ever cut it that short before. Objection, Your Honor. Well, he the witness indicate. did not indicate he needed his recollection refreshed or he didn't remember. He said he'd never seen it that short, sustained. In any event, he came up to you that day and he told you that his, let me get this straight, that his attorney said that they need to develop a chronological timetable, correct? He used different words, but I'm paraphrasing what he said, yes. All right, but you were asked specifically about whether or not, and I think the specific question is, do you recall that he said the word they in his request regarding your cameras, right? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Yeah, I believe the state asked you specifically did Mr. Dulos use the word they in his statement that his attorney said they need to develop a chronological timeline? Yes. You remember that word being said specifically, correct? I do. I do. So in your response, the they refer to his attorney in him, correct? Objection. Well, the witness has testified that the word they was used. And the question now is essentially, what did the witness think they meant? Sustained. You gave a written statement, did you not, back in um, 2019? I did. Did you review your statement? I did. And your statement was actually taken under oath, correct? That's correct. And it was given on June 14th, 2019, right? That's correct. And didn't you, in your sworn statement, tell, uh, write down or state that Mr. Dulos said, um, It needed to show that he never left his house and that he was here Friday. Do you remember saying that in your statement? Can I read a copy of my statement? Of course. Please? Let me mark it. When was the last time you saw your statement, by the way, sir? Oh, I looked at it maybe a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I just have this marked. Marked as exhibit double E for ID. All right. May I approach? Yes. Now, sir, you're entitled to read the entire statement if you wish, but I'm going to call your attention to the paragraph on the subject that we're talking about right now. So if you need to read more, please feel free. But I'm going to call your attention on page two, just to this paragraph there, to see if that refreshes your recollection about what you told the police in your sworn statement. Yeah. Did that refresh your recollection? It refreshes my recollection of what's in the statement, yes. Right. And uh, you never used the word they in, the, in your statement with regard to that statement by Mr. Dulos, did you? I did not, not in the statement, no. I would object, you, Your Honor, at this point, counsel is mischaracterizing the statement and the word it and they. Uh, from my reading, the word it refers to his uh, video camera system. The witness testified that the word they was in reference to a timeline they needed to develop. Well, 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 yeah. well, the statement well, speaks for itself, Your Honor. Well, then the court has to read the statement. May I approach? Yes. This paragraph here, Your Honor, and I believe it's the state that's misrepresenting what it says.
Just a defense referring to the first full paragraph on page two of three of the statement. Yes, Your Honor. Well, counsel, would you point out the language that brought your concern? Well, of course, the statement is not in evidence, but the court does not see how this statement is in any way inconsistent with what the witness testified to. If Your Honor pleases, I will note the word they does not appear anywhere in that paragraph. The word he and it appears. Well, the issue, as the court understands it, is what did Fotis Dulos say concerning the video? Exactly, Your Honor. That they needed it. That's how the court understood the testimony. Right. Now, the court cannot, at this point, understand whether they refers to the defendant and someone else, Fotis Dulos and someone else, or the police. They needed it. So at this point, uh, the court is going to sustain the objection. I just want to be clear. Anywhere in your, in your statement regarding your conversation with Mr. Dulos, did you ever use the word they in describing the conversation in your written statement? I'm sorry. I don't understand that question. Can did you the word that one, they appear anywhere in your written version of your conversation with Mr. Dulos? Not to my recollection. Well, would looking at it again refresh your recollection? Well, the court is not going to allow that because you're asking the witness to find the word they in the statement. The word they is not in the statement. The All court right. does not even follow what they refers to. So to essentially cast that failure to use the word they as an inconsistent statement is not persuasive. During the time that you um, met with, you said you knew Mr. Dulos um, over the course of many years, correct? I did say that. And, and you testified that, you know, you had like a neighborly relationship with him, correct? I would describe it as neighborly. So you got to see him in scenarios other than in this formality of uh, requesting to see your, or that you, re that you keep your videos, correct? That's correct. But you wouldn't consider Mr. Dulos a friend, would you? I would not. In fact, when you talked to the police, you talked that you told them that he was condescending towards women, correct? He could be condescending towards women. Yes. Is there a reason that you suggested that to the police at that time? There was a reason. Could you tell us what that is? He was very condescending to my wife. And not just your wife? I can tell you the reason why I said that, and the reason was he was condescending towards my okay. wife. And you, did, you found that a little offensive, I take it? I did. Let me just have a moment, Your Honor. Nothing further. Nothing further, thank you. Dr. you may step down. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.
Thank you, sir. Your Honor, may I have a moment with attorney? Yes. I'm not sure who is doing that. Awesome. May I have a moment, Your Honor? Yes. Your Honor, um, the next witness is uh, Mike Meehan, Your Honor. Uh, I leave it up to the court if Your Honor wishes to, uh, we can take a short recess or if um, I can call him in and we can start. Well, there are matters that uh, counsel wish the court to take up. And, well, would counsel approach, please?
One last thing, Your Honor, if I may. Um, state's ready to proceed, Your Honor, if I may call uh, Mike Meehan to the stand, please. Morning. You can please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or solemnly and sincerely affirm, as the case may be, that the evidence you shall give concerning this case shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God or upon penalty of perjury? I do. Please state your name and spell it for the record. Certainly. Michael Meehan, M-E-E-H-A-N. Mr. Meehan, you may be seated. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Attorney Meehan, you are an attorney practicing in Connecticut? I am. Are you allowed to practice law anywhere else? No. Do you have your own law firm? Yes. Uh, what is it called? Uh, it's called Meehan Law now. Do you work with other attorneys in your law firm? I do. I have uh, four other lawyers in my office. How long have you been an attorney? 1996. And do you specialize in a particular field? Uh, currently, most of my practice focuses on family law. Um, I still do practice criminal defense work. Uh, I used to do a lot of that. I don't do it as much anymore. Uh, and we keep a very small amount of civil litigation in the practice as well. As part of your work in family law, do you frequently get appointed as a guardian ad litem? I have. What is a guardian ad litem? Uh, a guardian ad litem uh, is a representative of children here in Connecticut. It could be either a lawyer or a psychologist. You have to be either licensed by the state for either position. Uh, and you have to now be certified uh, to act as a guardian ad litem. And what are some duties and responsibilities? Well, is guardian ad litem also called a GAL? Correct. Okay. What are some duties and responsibilities of a GAL? The, the primary duty and responsibility of a guardian ad litem is to represent the best interest of children. So in essence, one might say you become sort of the eyes and ears of the court. Typically, guardians are appointed in family matters where there are either limited issues or a general amount of disputes regarding issues of custody. And custody disputes include decision-making issues for the children between both parents and or where the children live uh, and or how frequently they get to see the other parent. Uh, and so typically, when parties in a family matter are in disagreement on those issues, many times either the court will on its own motion or the parties will either move the court or the parties will agree for the appointment of a guardian ad litem. And were you appointed as a guardian ad litem in the Dulos versus Dulos case? I was. When were you appointed? Uh, my recollection is that I was appointed sometime in the end of August of 2017, on around the 24th of 2017. And had the divorce already started? It had. How many children were you GAL for? Uh, five children. What were their names? Uh, Petros, uh, Theodore, Constantine, Christian, and the youngest one went by Noel, but I think she was Cleopatra Noel. And in 2017, did you meet with Jennifer Farber Dulos? I did. When did you first meet her? Uh, I met Jennifer uh, probably shortly after my appointment, sometime in August of, of 2017. Where was she living at that time? She was living in New Canaan. Did you ever meet her at 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan? I did. And did you meet Photos Dulos as well? I did. When did you meet him? Um, I met Mr. Dulos again around the same time shortly thereafter, uh, sometime in August of 17. And Michelle Traconis, have you ever met her? I have. When did you meet Michelle Traconis? Um, I met Ms. Traconis Sometime after I met Mr. Duos in August of 17, it would have been sometime you know, within that month of September or so. In 2017, did Fotos Duos ever express to you a um, desired outcome between uh, 
himself, Michelle Traconis, Jennifer, and for Jefferson Crossing? Uh, yes. And what was his uh, desired outcome? Well, when I met with Mr. Duos, um, he had expressed his preferences and what he wanted to see happen at the conclusion of the case, which is ultimately it was his goal to have everyone live in the house together, that being Ms. Dulos, along with the children, along with Ms. Draconis and her daughter as well. He indicated he wished uh, Jennifer, Michelle, and all the children reside at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Correct. Okay. Uh, when was that? In two, uh, that was, I think, early on in one of my first interviews with him, sometime in 17. Now, where was he living between 2017 and 2019? He was living at Fort Jefferson. As a GAL, are you or do you attend every court hearing? Uh, yes, unless I'm excused by the court for some reason. Sometimes there's financial disputes that don't require the guardian's attendance. I wouldn't attend to that. In November of 2017, uh, was a parenting plan in place? Uh, yes, I was able to help the parties uh, reach an agreement on a parenting plan um, somewhere around the month of November of 2017. And what exactly is a parenting plan, if you could just explain? A parenting plan is a document that um, gets filed in family cases, which really defines the issues of custody. Uh, who gets to make what decisions for the children, how those decisions are made, where do the children live, how frequently do they see each parent, uh, what happens during holidays, what happens during vacations. In essence, all of those things get boiled into a parenting plan. And at that time, the parties had, by agreement, um, reached a temporary agreement regarding parenting. In November 2017, based on that plan, was Michelle Traconis and her daughter allowed to have contact with the children? Yes. How long did that last? Um, well, it lasted, at, you know, at least from the time of that plan, uh, ultimately to some point in time in January of 2018. So about two months? They're about. And what happened in 2000 and, or January 2018? Uh, well, um, Well, if I can just withdraw that, Your Honor, um, yeah. I'll strike that, Your Honor, it's an open question. In January of 2018, what happened with respect to custody or parenting plans at, at, in um, with relation to Fotis Dulos? Mr. Dulos had his parenting time suspended by the court. And what does that mean? It means simply he was not permitted to have any contact with the children. And that also includes Michelle Traconis? Those orders at time, that time extended to Ms. Traconis as well. For how long was Fotis Dulos not able to have any contact at all with his children? He. Um, there was a period of time for which he had no contact. Um, contact was gradually reintroduced sometime in the month of February of 2018. Uh, and he was able to have then limited supervised contact with the children. What is supervised visitation? Supervised visitation is a form of visitation that the court will typically utilize to make sure that the safety of the children are being protected and uh, it would require the presence of a third party, either during the entire visit or at certain times of the visit. And the third party could be anyone from, uh, you know, a, a family member to a paid professional. For how long did that supervised visitation plan stay in effect? Well, the, it was an order, not a plan. So the, the supervised visitation order uh, remained in effect uh, from January of 2018 uh, through um, really the time period for which the case was dismissed. And uh, thank you for clarifying that for me, order versus plan. Can you just explain the difference? Sure. So the, when I used the term order, that was as a result of something that the court had issued, a ruling, a decision, an order. Um, the plan, you know, uh, as we were talking about before, ultimately became an order, but it was because of agreement of the parties. Um, so the supervised visitation was as a result of a court order? The supervised visitation was a result of a court order. So during March of 2000, say March of 2018 and May of 2019, were there court hearings 
that were um, the subject of the supervised visitation uh, were held of? Yes. Okay. And were any of those hearings successful for Fotos Duos? Um, Mr. Duos had, had sought um, supervised visitation and that he sought that over quite some time. And ultimately the court granted his request for supervised visitation when previously there was, was an order of, of no access. Um, and I believe the court issued its ruling on that in March of 2019. And did that, uh, well, when there was supervised visitation that was scheduled for Photostulos and the children between um, March 2018 and May 24th, 2019, uh, was Michelle Traconis allowed to have contact with those children? No. So if the children were present at Fort Jefferson Crossing between March of 2018 and May 24th of 2019, uh, what would Michelle Traconis and her daughter have to do? Uh, not be present. And was that for every visit throughout the course of that year? It, it was, to the best of my recollection, after the court had entered orders in March of 19, those orders permitted the children to go back to Fort Jefferson Crossing where they had not been permitted to go to for that prior period of time from January of 18 up to that point in time. Okay. And so from, from March of 19 on, the children were permitted to go to uh, Fort Jefferson pursuant to the orders, but Ms. Traconis could not be present. So between March of 2018 and March of 2019, the children weren't even allowed to go to Fort Jefferson Crossing? Correct. And, um, and Michelle Traconis was not allowed to have contact with the children during that time period? Correct. In March of 2019, were the children allowed to go to Fort Jefferson Crossing? There was no restrictions about their being able to go there, but there were restrictions as it pertained to supervision and Ms. Traconis' ability to go, okay. to be present during the parenting time. Did those restrictions include a supervisor continuing to be present during the visitation? Correct. And did those restrictions also include Michelle Traconis and her daughter having to have to leave if they were there? Correct. And did that stay in effect until May of 2000, May 24, 2019? Yes. Um, in March of 2019, uh, did you have a telephone conversation with Photostulos and Michelle Traconis? I did. What was the subject of that conversation? Uh, the subject of that conversation was the decision that had just been issued uh, by Judge Heller regarding Mr. F uh, Duos's uh, motion for supervised visitation. And what was that motion for, or what was the decision? Uh, the decision was that um, Mr. Duos would be permitted to have supervised visitation with the children, um, but it, also, there were limitations on that visitation, including Mr. Conus and her daughter not being able to be present. And this conversation occurred over the phone? That's correct. Okay. How did Fotos Dulos sound? Um, on that day, uh, Mr. Dulos was down. Um, he was concerned uh, and he was upset. And what did he say about say to you? Um, I, if I may, I know I, I have a file note on this, and perhaps if I could have an opportunity just to refresh my recollection, I want to be consistent with, with uh, my note. Well, let me ask you this, sir. Uh, are you required to take notes as a GAL? I am. Is that part of your responsibilities and duties as a GAL appointed by the court? It is. And do you take those notes as a part of and parcel of your duties as a GAL? Are they done in a timely manner? Yes. Yes. Your Honor, State's going to offer 142, if I can, um, after objection. Uh, sir, can you just ask you a couple questions about it? Is there an sure. objection to State's no, 142? 142 admitted as false. Thank you, 
Do you recognize that, sir? I do. What is it? Uh, this is a copy of a note that I made to the file uh, dated March 21, 2019. Is that the note that you took regarding the telephone conversation with, between Fotos Dulos and Michelle Traponis? Yes, it is. Sir, let me ask you some questions while the machine is warming up, if you will. Sure. Um, did you call Fotos Dulos that day? Or? Uh, he called me. And what did he say? Um, generally speaking, he called to talk about the uh, court's decision um, that um, had just granted his motion for supervised visitation, but it placed the restrictions um, on his parenting time so that Ms. Traconis and her daughter couldn't be present. And generally speaking, he was upset about that. And did he say anything specifically about expressing his, um, his feelings about the continued litigation? And if I can, I'll refer while the computer's not working out. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, if that helps to refresh your recollection. Yes. And what did he say? Uh, he indicated that he was concerned that the continued litigation would having an adverse impact on his relationship with Mr. Conus. And what did you say in response? Um, I indicated to him, um, really just in summary, that you know the court had issued a decision which created a pathway forward for um, Ms. Traconis and her daughter to be able to uh, work with me with both parties in an effort to try to provide access to them in a future date, but that I wasn't his lawyer and I couldn't advocate for him and you know deal with issues within the context of the litigation. And did you subsequently speak to Michelle Traconis as well? I did. And what did she sound like on the phone? Um, she was down as well. Uh, she was frustrated. Um, she had expressed um, disappointment and really just a, a lack of understanding as to why the court had not allowed access between her and the children. And did you make any suggestions? I did. Um, if I may just take a look at the note. If you can. Thank you. Actually, sir, it is an exhibit and the Elmo is not working, Your Honor. I'm going to ask if the witness can just publish the note by reading it. Well, it's a full exhibit. The witness can read it. If you can, uh, turn me in if you wouldn't mind just reading the whole note. Not a problem. Thank you. So this is dated um, March 21, 2019. It's titled Phone Call with Fotis Duos and Michelle Traconis. Uh, it states, today I received a phone call from Fotis Duos who wanted to discuss the court's memorandum of decision regarding supervised visitation. Mr. Dulos was upset because the court didn't grant immediate access between Michelle Traconis and Nicole and the minor children. Mr. Dulos was concerned and didn't know if he could continue on with the litigation because it was having an adverse effect on his relationship with Michelle. Mr. Dulos repeatedly asked if I could intervene and do something on behalf of the children regarding this issue. I reminded Mr. Dulos as I have throughout the case that I do not represent him. I'm not permitted to act as an advocate for either party. Fotis asked if I could speak to Michelle Traconis. I agreed and he placed her on the phone. Michelle wanted to know what she had done to cause the court to order that she not be permitted uh, in contact with the children. 
I informed her that the court's recent decision created a pathway for the parties to start discussing a plan to reintroduce her and Nicole to the children to work with me as GAL. I asked her even if she, if she had ever met or spoke with Jennifer Duos. She indicated that she hadn't, but would be open to speaking with her or meeting her for coffee to discuss being reintroduced to the children. Michelle indicated that she didn't move here for all this and that she felt badly for the children and Nicole. She believes that they have all been the victim of this litigation. She is also divorced and she doesn't act this way with Nicole's father. Her tone was calm but very down. The conversation lasted about five minutes with her. The conversation ended after that. Thank you, sir. Now, that was in March of 2019? That was March 21st, 2019. And at some point, uh, did uh, Fotis Dulos indicate that he thought the custody case was going to change in his favor? Yes. When was that? Um, that would have been uh, probably at the end of April 2019. It is now 11.17. We're going to stand in our morning recess until 11.35. Please do not discuss the case.
This honorable superior <coughs> court is now open and in session. The honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Please be seated. Thank you. Tony Felson. Thank you, Your Honor. Before the jury comes out, I'd like to have um, a document marked for ID purposes only and ask that it be filed conditionally under seal. The state was uh, kind enough to prepare an envelope. So if I can pass it up to the clerk and represent on the record what it is. It is um, the final four pages of the custody report that has been the topic of discussion. On the front page of those four pages is a release and it states pursuant to the order of the court at the May 25th, 2021 hearing, a complete copy of the custody evaluation in the above matter is attached to this letter. As stated on the record, the report is released to the defendant and all dissemination restrictions apply pursuant to practice book 25-60. The pages that are enclosed are pages 67, 68, and 69, which are the conclusion pages of the report. If I can please pass it up to the clerk. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Just if I may, if counsel can just get me a copy of everything that's contained, um, so I can just have a copy of what that is, then. Didn't you give her a copy? Yeah. Didn't you give it? Attorney Meehan, you may take your Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> you can bring the jury out. Oh, and uh, just for the record, too, Your Honor, uh, I have no objection to that being lodged as part of the case uh, for the state's position. Thank you. Council stipulate, please. Yes, sir. Yes. Honor. yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Silly Attorney Meehan. How are you? I'm fine. Good morning. Um, just a couple more questions, okay? Certainly. Um, at some point uh, in 2018, around that, two, I'm sorry, at some point in April of 2019, uh, did photos. Uh, Dulos indicate that he believed the custody case was going to change in his favor? Yes. And when was that? Um, it would have been sometime after um, the custody evaluation report uh, was complete. Uh, would that be around April or May of 2019? Uh, that would have been probably uh, the end of April of 2019, yes. How did Fotos Dulos react when he read that evaluation report? Um, I was present well, with him and his lawyer uh, when he reviewed the report. Um, and he was uh, a combination of emotions, I think. Um, on the one hand, he was encouraged. Uh, on the other hand, he was upset uh, and outraged. Um, but ultimately, you know, his concern was he was concerned for the children. And did he file a motion? He did. How did he react after that motion, motion was, well, I should ask a foundation question. Was that motion heard in May of 2019? Uh, he filed uh, a motion with the court uh, and ultimately was heard in May of 2019, yes. How did he react after that motion had been heard? Uh, well, the motion was started at what it had not completed um, and he uh, became frustrated uh, after the first hearing day that we had on his motion. Was the supervised visitation still in place after the May hearing? It was. And nothing had changed? It had not. Did you speak to Fotos Dulos after Jennifer had been reported missing? I did. When did you do that? Uh, I received a phone call from Mr. Dulos the morning of May 25th, uh, early in the morning. How did he sound? Uh, he was very excited. 
in the course of the call. Um, I mean, I have, I have a detailed note on it. Uh, again, did you document a note as part of your duties as a GAL? I did. Okay. If I may just approach the clerk. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, Your Honor, the witness will be reading, just that uh, the witness can be instructed just to read it a moderate pace for the interpreter. Certainly, thank you. Your Honor, State would offer 143. I don't think there's any objection. I'd ask to be moved in evidence. No objection to State 143. No, Your Honor. State 143 admitted as full. Thank you. Attorney Mann, what is 143? Um, exhibit 143 is a copy of another file note that I made. Uh, this one dated um, May 25, 2019, and it's titled Jennifer Missing. Do you make these notes, by the way, at the same around the time that the event occurs? I do. And is that part of your duties as a guardian ad litem? It's, it's part of my practice, um, but yes. Okay. Uh, as that's a full exhibit, I'm going to ask if you can read that, please. Uh, certainly. It's titled Jennifer Missing. Uh, dated May 25, 2019. Uh, today, I received a phone call from Fotis Duos at 10.26 a.m., who informed me that Jennifer Duos was missing. He stated to me, Mike, have you heard the news? I replied, no. He then stated, Jennifer is missing. I noticed the tone in his voice to not be down or somber, but to be more excited. I don't know what to attribute the tone to his voice to. I asked, when did she go missing? And he indicated sometime yesterday, 5-24-19. I asked him where he was yesterday and whether he had an alibi. He said he was home in Farmington all morning, then in meetings. He mentioned he had cameras in his house. He immediately asked about the children and wanted me to address their safety. He told me they were in New York with Jennifer's mother and Lauren. He went on to tell me that Jennifer had made dental appointments for the children in New York and that he didn't know about the appointments or agree to them. A review of OFW shows Jennifer did advise him of a New York uh, orthodontist uh, on 5-13-19 via OFW and offered to advance the cost. I ended the call with him and began, phone, and began getting phone calls from attorney Midler, New Canaan PD, and Jacob Petranker. I spoke with New Canaan PD, and they informed me of the investigation involving Connecticut State Police Major Crime Squad. They informed me that Jennifer's home in New Canaan was a major crime scene. The police asked for permission to interview the children, and I authorized the police to speak with them. Sir, as part of your responsibilities as a guardian ad litem, between 2017 and 2019, did you speak often with uh, Jennifer Farber Duos? I did. And after May 24, 2019, have you heard or seen Jennifer Farber Duos since then? Sadly, I've never spoken to her again. Thank you. I have nothing further. <coughs> Bless you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to come up and grab that back from you, if you don't mind. No problem. Thank you. You said you were the guardian ad litem for the Dulos children from August of 2017 through 2019? Correct. And um, you were appointed by the court? Ultimately, yes. Is that a situation where the parties need to agree to have you appointed? <clears throat> Not always, but in this case, the parties reached an agreement on my appointment. By parties, it would be Jennifer Dulos and Fotis Dulos? Correct. And Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos were engaged in litigation during that time period? Uh, 2017, yes. Related to parenting and custody? Correct. 
And that litigation was between them. It, it wasn't Michelle Traconis. She wasn't a party to that in any way. Ms. Traconis was not a party to their divorce, no. The court can appoint you as a GAL. You can have uh, certain duties. Some of those duties can be limited by the court. Correct. Were your duties limited in any way when you were appointed uh, by the court to be the guardian ad litem for the Dulos children? Only to the extent that the parties had um, reached a signed agreement that set forth my duties, but those duties really mirrored the, the official duties as listed on a court form that we have. So in, in essence, it was all duties. And were your duties ever during that time period restricted in any way by the court? No. As the guardian at litem, you had said that you um, represent the best interests of the children. That's correct. That you're basically the eyes of the court. That's correct. You're a fact finder for the court. Correct. You don't work for FOTUS. No. You, you didn't work for Jennifer Dulos. Correct. And, and you certainly don't work for Michelle. That's correct. During those two years, between 2017 and 2019, and not to get into what you said, but did you at times report to the court <laughs> about uh, your findings and what you thought was in the best interest of the children. I did. Did you do that based on interviews with the children? Amongst other things, yes. Also uh, interviews with uh, Fotis Doulis? Correct. And Jennifer? Correct. And, and you met Michelle before? I have. Uh, you, uh, I think, had dinner once at Fort Jefferson Crossing sometime at the end of 2017? I did. And you also spoke to mental health experts? I did. And treatment providers? Yes. Did you also speak to the party's attorneys? I did. Did both parties have attorneys? Um, Ms. Dulos was represented by counsel the entire time, and Mr. Dulos was represented by counsel at times, was also self-represented at times. Let's start with Ms. Dulos. She had an attorney at one point. Uh, to start out, was that attorney Eric Broder? Correct. Did she at some point switch attorneys? She did. And she had uh, Reuben Midler represent her? Correct. At some point, Fotis Doulis had an attorney named Jacob Petranker? That's correct. Did he at some point switch attorneys? He did. Was Mike Rose one of his attorneys? He became one, yes. Was Mike Rose Fotis Doulis' attorney in April and May of 2019? I believe so, yes. You had said at times that Fotis uh, represented himself. Correct. Did Fotis file his own motions? He did. Did he make his own arguments to the court? He did. Fotis isn't an attorney, is he? Not to the best of my recollection, no. To get a timeline here, you talked about sometime in January of 2018, you had said that Fotis's visitation was suspended by the court. Correct. Uh, and at some point in the spring of 2018, were you aware that Fotis had filed a motion to modify that order? That's correct. During the course of the spring of 2017, there were many months of hearings? Of 18. Of 2000, spring of 2018? Uh, yes. And those hearings occurred over the course of several months? That's correct. Related to visitation? Amongst other issues, yes. Parenting issues, though? Correct. During the course of those hearings in the spring of 2018, from January until mid-2018, uh, <laughs> did the court ever enter interim orders? Um, the court did. And were those orders permitting FOTUS to have supervised parenting time with the children? Yes. Was FOTUS's supervision uh, had by a court-ordered supervisor? Yes. Was that Dennis Puebla? That's correct, and his group. And his group. So other people who worked for Dennis Puebla would also be monitoring that supervised visitation. That's correct. So during the course of those hearings, pursuant to the court's orders, FOTUS would be able to visit with the children. During that time period, yes. At some time during that time period, there was a court-ordered custody and psychological report that was to be prepared? That's correct. Is that requested by the parties? Are you asking me in this case or just in general? Can either party request it in general? Either party has the right to ask the court to appoint a court-appointed evaluator or to ask the Office of Family Relations to conduct a custody study. And that custody study helps the court make a decision related to custody and parenting issues? 
it is a piece of information that the court can consider when entering orders for custody, yes. And in this case, do you know whether one of the parties requested that such a custody report be prepared? Um, I believe so, yes. I'm trying to recall the time period. Was it sometime in 2018? It, there was a, a, a motion to have a private custody evaluation. Um, and I believe the motion was filed, yes, by one of the parties. In 2018? That's correct. It may, it, may have been, it may have been filed sometime in 17, but acted on in 18. Not getting into the contents of this particular custody report at all, I'm talking about custody reports in general. Uh, you had mentioned that sometimes they're prepared by family relations. Correct. Can you tell the jury a little bit what family relations role is here in the courthouse related to custody evaluations? I'm gonna object, Your Honor. Relevance to anything in general with respect to well, the custody, family relations. There's already been testimony that the custody evaluation was prepared by a private party and not family relations, so it's not relevant. I can ask related to private ones. Um, can you? Can you tell the jury a little bit about what, in general, a custody report entails? Object, Your Honor. Relevancy. Well, the court understands the question. Custody reports are going to entail, all custody reports don't entail the same information. So that question is too general to be useful to the jury. I can ask follow-up questions, Your Honor. Uh, do custody reports uh, involve interviews with the parties? Uh, generally, yes. Um, sometimes do they involve evaluations by treatment providers? Sometimes, yes. Mental health treatment providers? Sometimes, yes. And one of the factors that is addressed in uh, custody reports is a parent's um, psychological status. That is one of the factors under our custody statute. I'm gonna object, Your Honor. These questions are running over the double yellow line. Sustained. In this particular report, was somebody appointed to conduct a custody evaluation? Yes. Who was appointed as an evaluator? Objection. Sustained. Was it a psychiatrist who Objection. was appointed? Objection. Sustained. Did both parties agree on who was going to conduct the evaluation? Objection. Well, did both parties agree? That's overruled. Yes. Did the court accept that individual to participate in the evaluate to conduct the evaluation? Objection. Sustained. How long did it take for this custody report to be prepared? Objection. Well, what's the ground? Your Honor, the, even getting into the length of time it takes to prepare it suggests that it's the, the contents suggest it goes into, opens the door to uh, what was involved in in conducting and creating that report, and uh, also the relevance of how long it takes. Well, the court will sustain the objection on relevance grounds. During the course of the custody report being prepared, were there hearings in court related to custody and visitation? Yes. <clears throat> Let's skip to March of 2019. You had indicated that the judge, it was Judge Heller in this case, who handled the family matters? That's correct. Um, she entered orders allowing FOTUS to have supervised visitation. Correct. By that point, March of 2019, was the custody report well underway? Objection. Well, this is another way of trying to determine through this witness how long did it take to prepare the custody report? Sustained. Was it your understanding in March of 2019 that the custody report was about to be completed? Objection. Sustained. During that, in that March 
20th order from Judge Heller was Fotis Doulis allowed supervised custody, supervised visitation. Yes. And it was sometimes at Fort Jefferson? Uh, it was permitted at that time. And sometimes in Fairfield County? Correct. And in that order, Judge Heller ordered the parties to work together with the guardian at litem. Correct. And that's you? Correct. Um, and to come up with some kind of process or timetable to have Michelle and her daughter, Nicole, to be able to be present during that visitation. That's correct. And um, that was based on your recommendations. I want to be mindful. Um, as I understand, the courts issued an order of protection regarding um, seal hearings, uh, confidentiality, et cetera. Um, so I'm, my hesitation on answering the question is, um, if you're asking me a question that requires a response about something that I recommended in the context of a sealed hearing, I'm not necessarily sure that that's in keeping. That's covered by the protection. I, I can order. rephrase that, Your Honor. Um, you at the time were the guardian at Latham. At the, at the time of? Of Judge Heller's order. Yes. And in the months prior to? Correct. Your role as guardian of the line is to be the eyes and the ears of the court? That's correct. And you provide feedback to the court? Correct. Upon which she bases her decisions? That's correct. You had told the jury about a phone conversation that you had with Fotis Doulis the following day? Yes. March 21st, 2019? Yes. Is that correct? And you prepared, um, you take notes. That's correct. Um, of your conversations with parties? Yes. Related um, to your communications? Correct. And you did in this case? Yes. Did you take that note on or about March 21st, 2019? There about, yes. And you said that FOTUS wanted to see if you could do something to facilitate contact quicker? Correct. Did you learn at some point that Michelle's plan was to move out of state? Um, I, I became aware that she was looking to move away from all this, yes. All right. And by all of this, you mean the litigation? That's correct. All right. Because um, it was your understanding that Michelle didn't have that kind of relationship with her family? That's correct. Or the father of her child? Correct. And it was very disappointing to her? That's what she'd expressed to me, yes. And she didn't want to be around it? Correct. And she told you she felt bad for the kids? She did. You explained that the court's order was a positive development. Correct. That it represented progress. Correct. Um, and you did think that at the time? Yes. Right. And things were progressing? Slowly, but yes, they were progressing. Through the courts? Correct. Pursuant to the court orders? Correct. And at the time, Fotis was working with his attorney? Yes. At that time, it was Mike Rose? Yes. Sometime in April or May of 2019, there was a custody report that was completed. Correct. Do you remember what date that was? Uh, it would have been sometime in the last week of April, perhaps the 26th or 27th of April, 2019. All right. Would it refresh your recollection to look at a document? Uh, perhaps. All right. May I approach Your Honor? Your Honor, I'm going to object to this line of questioning as to when, what date, what, uh, what any particulars with respect to the custody report. If counsel, if this is just a foundation question. It um, is. Uh, well, the question is, at some point, well, the term at some point is meaningless. It was completed. And the answer is yes. Your Honor, the, the date that we're talking about is just a month prior to, to the incident for which we're here. And during the state's direct, this time period was especially an in interest uh, to the state as well as FOTUS's mindset and the way that he was reacting to the release of the report within this specific time frame. So if the question is, was it completed on such and such a date, the witness can respond. 
Uh, was the report completed on or around April 24th, 2019? Thereabouts. You reviewed that report? I, I reviewed the report. You gave the parties the opportunity to review the report? I offered both parties an opportunity to review the report with their counsel, yes. But you did not disseminate the report. You didn't make copies of the report and give that out to anybody? No, I did not. And that is pursuant to a statute or a court order? Um, well, in, in this particular case, there um, was no agreement previously by the parties regarding the publication or dissemination of the report. It's my general practice with these types of reports that they not be provided to parties or to their counsel unless there's a court order that limits or uh, controls the dissemination or the use of such a report because we don't want these reports falling into the, the public realm in any way. Um, and in this particular case, there was uh, no actual court order in that regard, but there was um, discussions and work towards that. Um, so that's to answer your question. So you did not disseminate the, the report to anybody? Correct. But the parties had an opportunity to review that report at your office? That's correct. Uh, did Fotis come to your office and review that report? With his counsel, yes. He was there with Mike Rose? That's correct. And reviewed the report. And um, you indicated that as a result of the report, he was encouraged? That's correct. All right. And um, without getting into the discussion, did, did he tell you why he felt encouraged? Well, that's going to run counter to the protective order. Of course, not going to allow that question. All right. You, you had also indicated he was upset and outraged. That's correct. As a result of reviewing that report, um, did Fotis' attorney file a motion with the court? Uh, he filed a motion with the court. Was that a motion for custody? No, object, Your Honor. Well, the fact that the parties read the report, the next question gets into what would be the nature of what he read such that he would file a motion for custody, which this, gets into the content of the report. This is my last question in that It doesn't line, matter Your whether it's the last question. The question is whether it's inadmissible, sustained. In May of 2019, was it your expectation that FOTUS's access to the children was going to continue to progress? Objection. Sustained. In May of 2017, was Jennifer Doulis more agreeable to visitation? Objection, Your Honor. Well, in May of 2017. Of 19, I apologize, Your Honor. Well, if that question isn't covered by the notes, the court is not going to risk having any content pulled from the page of the custody report. It's not from the custody that question. report. Here. You were still the GAL in May of 2019? Yes. And you were still involved with parenting and custody issues related to Fotos Doulos? Yes. And part of, of those, um, one of the aspects of that was supervised visitation? Correct. Were you aware that um, Mr. Doulos was allowed supervised visitation during that period? Yes. Was that supervised visitation a little more flexible during that time period? Uh, just so I understand the time period, which time period are you referring to? In May of 2019. Um, the parties had um, been communicating a little more frequently and with a little more ease. With a little more ease? Yes, in regards to his parenting time. And were you aware that um, Jennifer had allowed photos to visit with the children at her home? I, yes, I was aware of that. All right, at 69 Wells? Yes. 
Following that filing by FOTUS's attorney, Mike Rose, in May of 2019, uh, there were court hearings? Yes. And were there scheduled court hearings for after May 24th, 2019? Uh, yes. You had another conversation with Mr. Dulos uh, on May 25th. 25th, 2019, or was it 24th, 2019? I spoke with Mr. Duels, if I recall, on May 25th, 2019. And he told you that Jennifer was missing? Correct. He also told you that uh, Jennifer had scheduled dental appointments for the kids? Correct. And he told you that he was unaware of them? I'd have to look at the note as to whether or not he was aware of it or not. All right, we're looking at it. Refresh your recollection? Please. Can I have the question again? Yeah. Yes. Yes. In that phone conversation, Fotis told you that the children had a dental appointment in New York of which he was unaware. Correct. Uh, and he told you he didn't agree to that? I don't recall if he said he didn't agree to it other than just he was not aware. You were able to check in something called OFW? That's correct. Is that Our Family Wizard? That's correct. Can you tell the jury what OFW, Our Family Wizard, is? Certainly. Um, Our Family Wizard, also known as OFW, is a um, computer service, application service, that uh, sometimes are used in cases that allows parents to be able to communicate back and forth with each other. And many times um, when we have cases like we had in this case, we use that as a tool so that we can document when messages are sent between parents and the guardian is sometimes invited into those communications as I was here. I can monitor these communications. And it also allows each parent to see if as and when certain messages when they're sent are read. Because many times these involve decision making issues it need to be done in a timely fashion, and frequently we are met with, I didn't know, I wasn't aware, when we can track that on OFW. In this case, you were able to track that? That's correct. And, and you knew that uh, FOTUS was in fact aware that there was a dental appointment? Via the OFW message, correct. And, and that FOTUS had lied? If that's what you want to call it. Uh, and FOTUS lying had been a problem throughout the course of your uh, role as a GAL from 2017 to 2019? The, again, Your Honor, I, I don't mean to uh, interfere, but if, if the question's going to information that would call for me to have to testify about something that was subject to a sealed proceeding. Right. Well, I can ask. The, at this point, this is now character evidence. And so the code indicates, not indicates, the code states that evidence of a person's character is not admissible to prove action and conformity therewith on a particular occasion. However, there may be evidence introduced as to character for truthfulness or untruthfulness, but that can only be done by opinion or reputation, not at the start by specific instances of conduct. Attorney Mann, you didn't uh, so represent. the court hasn't finished. Thank you, Your Honor. Sustain. Thank you. Uh, you as the guardian ad litem did not represent Mr. Dulos? No. But you had many conversations with him throughout the course of your representation of the children? Correct. Was it your opinion that Mr. Dulos lied an awful lot? Yes. When you were speaking to Mr. Dulos on May 25th, 2019, uh, he told you that Jennifer was missing? Correct. And 
and you asked him where he was the day before? Correct. And whether he had an alibi? Correct. And um, you told him to make sure he had every second accounted for? I'd have to look at the note again to see exactly what I said. Do you recall telling him words to that effect? Again, I'd have to look at the note, Attorney Felsen. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes. Yeah. I've had a chance to refresh my Thank recollection. Thank you. Again. I don't see that in the note. Whether or not you see that in the note, do you recall having a conversation with Fotis about accounting for his time on that day? I think we had a general conversation about that, thus the reference to the being at home and the cameras, et cetera. And the importance of doing that. Well, I didn't give him any instruction of what was important or not. You didn't give him any instruction at all, right? Correct. Because you weren't his attorney. That's correct. But you did indicate that he should have his time accounted for. Again, I don't think I gave him any instruction. Okay. It wasn't an instruction, but you did discuss that with him. I discussed where he was, what he was doing, whether or not he had an alibi. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, our next witness is actually coming from out of state. They will be here around 2.30. I would ask some indulgence in a longer lunch. How many witnesses are scheduled for this afternoon? Attorney? Just one, Your Honor. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will reconvene at 2.30. Please do not discuss the case. We will reconvene at 2.30. Yes, um, if I can just ask, and I apologize if I missed it, did Your Honor order that document sealed on behalf of the defense? I well, just... it was, well, it was in a sealing envelope, correct?
according to the practice book? It is, Your Honor, yes. Yes, it is, Your Honor. So the court will order it sealed. Thank you. Thank you.